kicking off our list at number 10, first class passengers. While traveling in first class it might feel more comfortable at first, but when it came to the sinking of the Titanic, first class passengers had a better chance at survival. You would think obviously, but Here's why. Just over 200 first class passengers survived out of the 324 souls traveling in first class during that fateful voyage. That's a lot of people. I mean, a lot of people passed away, but in hindsight, a lot of people made it. If you've seen the James Cameron film, you know women and children were first to board these lifeboats. And then afterwards, it was first class men. See, by that point, there were few lifeboats left, which I'll get into, of course, later on. But second class and third class, their chances at survival here, right off the bat, were not great, simply because they were divided by class. Being stored further and lower from these lifeboats, the odds weren't in their favor. There were more than 700 third class passengers, and that number exceeded the other two classes combined. It's horrible. Those rooms were crammed. Four people would have to share one tiny room and the beds were smaller than twin beds. So when it comes to evacuating quickly, sadly these passengers had the hardest time getting out, which we don't often think of when we think of, you know, the Titanic and the sinking of it. Number nine, the band. We know how passionate musicians can be and we know that music can heal a lot of people, of course. While I'm absolutely sure there is nothing that could have been done to completely erase people's worries about what was about to happen on the Titanic that fateful night, the ship's orchestra did what they could, which was to play music. And I'm sure that it helped somebody in some way, shape, or form. It wasn't just in the movie. Movie, right? The eight orchestra members continued to play as the ship sank in order to try and keep spirits up. First, it was widely believed that they did this because they were ordered to, and for the record, if this were the case, that still would have been insanely brave of them too, but it turns out this is far from the truth. See, the band members were in fact not ship employees at the time, which means they technically had the same rights as any other passenger to leave and board a ship, but they chose not to. They all unfortunately passed away in the sinking of the ship and they played until they couldn't anymore, which I think is horribly sad sad, but also very beautiful and heroic of them. The film can't quite capture the beauty. I'm sure that their heroism helped a lot of people who are also in this terrible situation, and I'm glad their acts have been remembered, even still. Number eight, locked doors. Ellen Hakarian was aboard the Titanic that fateful night, and Tanky Magazine actually published her survival story afterwards, titled, Going Down with the Titanic in Third Class. Yeah, I mentioned the first class differences between third class, so this story here is already a feat in itself. Ellen and her husband, Pecco, decided to leave Finland and start a new life in America. America. The night of April 14th, after the couple had returned to their cabin and got settled in, they heard a loud scraping sound, and the engines then started to act up. Pecco ran out to see what was going on. The hallway was tilted by the time Elin poked her head out moments later, once she heard a ruckus in the hallway. Then there was a knock at the door. One of her friends from Finland came in, and they said the ship was sinking, but Pecco was nowhere to be seen, and her friend asked, how did he get out of the passageway? All the doors are locked. I was confused. I didn't know what to do next. After a few moments, I grabbed my purse and life jacket and ran out to the passageway. The door was locked. All the doors were locked. A steward finally came along to guide the crew to third deck where they were then taken to the Carpathia and they didn't arrive to a safe ship until the sun was up the following day. So after losing her husband and all of her belongings, Ilan only received $125. That's all the ship could give them. They're like, we're sorry you lost everything. Here's the best we can do. That's it. Number seven, no binoculars. On that fateful night of the collision with the iceberg, binoculars were locked up the entire time. Now, of course, this could have changed literal history had they have been used, but why weren't they? The key to set lockup, storing the binoculars, was being held by Officer David Blair. Only before the Titanic's departure from Southampton, Officer Blair was pulled from the crew. Now, of course, this may not have made a difference at all, but it's important to note. To think that these were stashed in a locker in the crow's nest the entire time is haunting, now when you consider the history of it. The poor guy was trained transferred to another ship and forgot a key. The amount of times I've forgotten a key or taken a work key home by accident, I mean, it's a simple mistake, but in this case, tragedy, really. Number six, ignored flares. Just 20 miles away from where the Titanic sunk, there was another boat. This one was called the SS Californian. This boat had stopped in order to avoid the ice, and the crew on the Titanic had also received warnings about icebergs. The Titanic had received six warnings about icebergs before the collision. Now, while the first few warnings were received by the captain, not all six were. Why so? The captain of this other boat, he slowed down and actually saw the emergency flares being set off on the Titanic ahead, but he ignored them because he thought that they were company rockets. The SOS signals that the Titanic was sending out weren't received until the next day because the radio operator on that SS Californian had gone to sleep. Yep, he took a little power nap after ignoring all the flares. By the time they had heard these calls and arrived the next day, it was obviously too late, sadly. Number five, less lifeboats. Before the Titanic even set sail during the preparation for the journey, at some point, people made a decision to reduce the number of lifeboats that were on board. Why they did this? 
beats me, I don't know. They did this because they didn't want to clutter the deck, which is truly trivial when we're talking about the safety of, I don't know, 2,208 passengers that were on board that day. The number of lifeboats ended up being reduced to just 20, with an additional four that were, you know, collapsible. So 24-ish lifeboats, 2,208 passengers. Doesn't add up, it's not, uh, it's a terrible ratio. Which means they should have had time to launch every single one, but this would still be only enough for half the passengers on board. It was cursed from the get-go. And as you may or may not know, during the sinking of the ship, not even all the lifeboats were able to be launched as everything happened too quickly, and it was chaos. There are quite a few lessons that can be definitely learned from the sinking of the Titanic, because the more we learn, the more we realize that safety precautions taken for these ships simply were just not up to par. It wasn't really about the iceberg. I mean, that did it, but there were other things that could have helped. Number four, the card. In the remnants of the Titanic, there was an inspection card found that belonged to a woman named Marianne Meanwell. This must seem like any ordinary find after a wreck, but it revealed a grim story for the woman. Once the card was found, it was then revealed that Marianne was not intended to be on the Titanic at all, but by some turn of events, she unfortunately found herself as one of the passengers. The card shows us that she was originally meant to be traveling on a ship called the Majestic, but for some reason, the trip she'd originally planned was delayed, and she instead was a signed to the ill-fated Titanic. You can see the word majestic was actually crossed out on her card, which shows us the change in plans. It's, it's so haunting to look at now. There's no way anybody could have known or warned her. It's just a really tragic situation to look back on. And to physically see the cancellation of the ship gives me goosebumps. That's really horrible. Number three, Eliza Melvina Dean. This story really is something. Okay, buckle up. When thinking back to this tragedy, it's hard to imagine how it looked in real time, like being on the ship, right? I mean, you know, not from James Cameron's perspective, right? It was a moonless night in the pitch black. Of course the navigation was hard, of course it could have been handled better, or they could have listened to the numerous warnings, but again, it was pitch black. This is what the iceberg looked like in real life. Eliza Dean was only a newborn on the Titanic. Her parents were on the way to the States with everything that they owned packed up in their luggage. See, Eliza's father was actually on the deck at the time of the collision, so he saw the ship hit that iceberg. How terrifying is that? But in doing so, he knew in that moment, get the family, hit the deck, something bad's gonna happen. Even as third class passengers, they were thankfully some of the first on the lifeboats, which is incredible seeing as what I said earlier. It was Eliza, her brother, and her mother. They all got aboard safely, but her father, of course, never made it off, which is terrible, but his quick thinking saved his family. Number two, John Jacob Astor. As the ship was sinking, the first class passenger, John Jacob Astor, he put his young wife on one of the lifeboats and he was about to get in with her when he immediately saw two terrified children standing behind him. And it happened. He instead gave up his spot and let those other two children on the boat, which is just noble, it's brave, it's heroic. I, it's something that you ask yourself, could I do that? If it actually were to happen, would I have the willpower to do that? I hope so, this is absolute bravery. One of the Titanic survivors named Philip Mock saw John in one of his final moments later on after this brave moment. He saw him and his valet huddled together on one of the life rafts before they unfortunately froze in the cold water. It's tragic. This was indeed a very tragic event, but the positive news here is that both his wife and the child that she was carrying at the time were able to make it to safety, and they survived the entire ordeal. While there are many terrible stories from this day, we also don't hear enough about the bravery that people showed during this tragic event. And finally, number one, Molly Brown. In total, there were 706 people who survived the sinking of the Titanic. Molly Brown has been referred to as the unsinkable Molly Brown. And when you look into her story, it really checks out. Margaret Brown not only survived the Titanic, which is just an incredible feat in itself, and it's the odds there are just incredible, but once aboard the life ship, she threatened the quartermaster. She said she'll throw him overboard if he didn't go back immediately and start looking for more survivors. That's bad. That, that is something I will do. I hope I can do in a moment like this. That's incredible. Historically, this is where the accounts get a little hazy. See, it's not confirmed whether the boat actually went back to look, but after narrowingly surviving a tragedy, then you're barely conscious. You still think of other people? That's the, that's the moral of the story here. Margaret was traveling in Egypt, but when a grandchild got sick, she ended her trip early just to go back to the States and take care of them. When she got all this attention after surviving said disaster, she then campaigned publicly for women's rights and education for the poor. She was a bad ass in the boat and then a bad ass afterwards. Like, this is insane. There was a musical comedy in the 60s called The Unsinkable Molly Brown. So her name will be remembered for a while as it should be. Thank you, Molly. Starting off in our number 10 spot, we have the heads up. I'm not sure why, but for actual years, I thought that on the day of the Titanic sinking, the iceberg they hit just kind of came out of nowhere and surprised them. So imagine my surprise when I found out that wasn't true even in the slightest. It turns out the entire thing could have been avoided. The crew had received six warnings about the iceberg before the collision. While the first few warnings were received by the captain, not all of them were, and it's not 
totally clear why. Although the crew knew about the icy conditions on the water, they didn't slow down much, which some have called a reckless decision, but apparently this was standard practice at the time, so I suppose you can't really blame them. The final warning, however, was received from a ship that had halted for the night due to an ice field a few miles away, and when the message was being relayed to the captain, he cut it off and said to shut up as he was working Cape Race. In our number 9 spot today, we have the futility. This is more so something that happened prior to the fateful day of the Titanic sinking, but it's still quite unsettling and also kind of bizarre nonetheless. In 1898, a book called Futility was released by an author named Morgan Robertson. This book tells the story of a large ship named the Titan. The Titan sets out for its first sail but encounters and strikes an iceberg. This certainly sounds eerily familiar, doesn't it? Considering this book was released in 1898 and the real life event of the Titanic sinking happened in 1912, there are many people who believe that this novel predicted this fateful day. It's most likely a very strange coincidence, but man is it really weird. Even with the names being so close, let alone how the rest of the story just matches up so well. Maybe Morgan Robertson is a time traveler or some kind of prophet, but if he was to guess it would be kind of rude to just write a book about it rather than, I don't know, warn someone? In our number 8 spot today we have True Love. Two of the first class passengers who were on the ship were elderly couple Isidore and Ida Stratus. When the ship started to sink and lifeboats were being boarded, attendants were ushering Ida into one of the lifeboats, but of course without her husband since women and children were being rescued first. Ida however refused to leave her husband and Isidore refused to be rescued before other men. Instead they both chose to stay on the ship and they went down together. Ida said quote, I will not be separated from my husband. As we have lived, so we will die together. Survivors who witnessed their love last saw the pair standing on the deck with their arms around each other. This love story is incredibly tragic, but also just such a testament to how much they loved each other. I am very glad that they had one another in those very frightening moments. In our number 7 spot today, we have Take My Spot. John Jacob Astor was one of the first class passengers on the ship that day. As the ship was sinking, he put his young wife on one of the lifeboats and he was about to get in with her when he saw two absolutely terrified children standing behind behind him. He instead gave up his spot and let those two children on the boat, which is both noble, but it's also just the right thing to do. One of the Titanic survivors named Philip Mock saw John in one of his final moments. He saw him and his valet huddled together on one of the life rafts before they unfortunately froze in the cold water. This was indeed a very tragic event, but the positive news is that both his wife and the child she was carrying at the time were able to make it to safety and survive the whole ordeal, which also likely means that the children he gave his spot up for also survived. While there are many terrible stories from this day, we also hear quite a few about the bravery people showed during this tragic event. In our number 6 spot today we have the lifeboat. Before the Titanic set sail during the preparation for the journey, at some point people made a decision to reduce the number of lifeboats that were on board. They did this because they didn't want to clutter the deck, which is truly trivial when we are talking about the safety of the 2,208 passengers that were on board that day. The number of lifeboats boats ended up being reduced to just 20 with an additional 4 that were collapsible. This meant that, should they have had time to launch every single one, this would still only be enough for half of the passengers on board. That's a terrible ratio. And as you may or may not know, during the sinking of the ship, not even all of the lifeboats were able to be launched as everything happened too quickly. There are quite a few lessons that can be and definitely were learned from the sinking of the Titanic, because the more we learn, the more we realize that the safety precautions taken for the ship simply were just not up to par. In our number 5 spot today we have the card. In the remnants of the Titanic there was an inspection card found that belonged to a woman named Marion Meanwell. This may seem like a mundane find, but it revealed a very grim story for the woman. Once the card was found, it was revealed that Marion was not intended to be on the Titanic that day, but by some turn of events, she unfortunately found herself as one of the passengers. The card showed that she was originally meant to be traveling on a ship called the Majestic. For some reason, the trip she originally had planned was delayed and she instead was assigned to the ill-fated Titanic. You can see that the word Majestic was crossed out on her card, which shows us the change in plans. There clearly is no way anyone could have known 
known or warned her. It's just a really tragic situation all around. In our number four spot today, we have slow action. While we were just talking about lifeboats, I mentioned how there wasn't enough time to launch all of the ones on board. This is true, and while the Titanic sank fairly quickly, there would have been more time if only people were more prepared. What I mean is that from the point where the ship actually hit the iceberg until the first lifeboats were launched was an entire hour. That is way too long when it is an emergency of this magnitude, which obviously leaves us wondering why. Well, as it turns out, a lot of people thought that the alarm bells were actually just a drill and they stayed inside where it was warm. This is already terrible, but what's even worse is that for the people who didn't think it was a drill, they had absolutely no idea where to go or what to do in the case of an emergency. They had never done any lifeboat drills, so everyone was just panicking with nowhere to go. Due to this lifeboat delay, there wasn't enough time to launch all of the remaining lifeboats successfully. This means that there are likely many lives that could have been saved had they had some more direction or prior training. In our number three spot today, we have ignored help. Only 20 miles away from the location of the sinking of the Titanic was another boat called the SS Californian. This boat had stopped in order to avoid the ice, which was clearly a fantastic idea. What is pretty insane, however, is that the captain of this boat actually saw the emergency flares being set off on the Titanic, but he ignored them because he figured they were company rockets. And to make this matter even worse, the SOS signals that the Titanic was sending out weren't even received until the next day because the radio operator on the SS Californian had gone to sleep. By the time they heard these calls and arrived the next day, everyone had unfortunately already passed away and they weren't able to save anyone. Who knows what could have happened had they taken those emergency signals seriously? It's obviously not their fault, but it definitely makes you think. In our number two spot today, we have the band. We know how passionate musicians can be and we know how healing music is for a lot of people. While I am absolutely sure that there was nothing that could be done to completely erase people's worries about what was going on, the ship's orchestra did what they could, which was to play music. The eight orchestra members continued to play as the ship sank in order to try and keep spirits up, I'm sure for other passengers as well as themselves. At first, it was widely believed that they did this because they were ordered to, and for the record, if this were the case, that would still have been insanely brave of them, but as it turns out, this is far from true. The band members were in fact not ship employees, which means that they had the same rights as any passenger to leave, but they chose not to. They all unfortunately passed away in the sinking of the ship and they played until they couldn't anymore, which I think is horribly sad, but also very beautiful and heroic of them. I'm sure that their heroism helped a lot of people who were also in this terrible situation, and I'm glad that their acts have been remembered even still. In our number one spot today, we have Wrong Turn. Okay, so we talked about how many warnings about the iceberg were ignored, but what happened when people finally stopped ignoring them? Well, once the iceberg was actually spotted, the chief officer received this warning and he ordered the helmsman to turn the wheel. Apparently this was actually a huge mistake, but it's unlikely they would have known that at the time. Researchers now believe that if they hadn't turned the wheel, the ship might not have sunk. The ship itself had bulkheads in the bow, so it is very likely that had the ship collided head on with the iceberg, it actually would have been fine. They said that a head on collision would have either stopped the ship from sinking at all, or it would have at least sunk a lot more slowly, which would have given more time for people to be rescued. It's easy for us to look back and say this would have been the best move, but under that kind of pressure, it's tough to see things as clearly as we can right now. In our number 10 spot today, we have musical instruments. Two parts of a destroyed clarinet, as well as a violin that was played by bandmaster Wallace Hartley, were found among the wreckage of the Titanic. I know musical instruments aren't exactly a terrifying discovery, but the discovery reminds us of the heartbreaking story of the Titanic's band. As the Titanic sank, it is famously known that the band played on despite the absolutely horrific incident that was taking place around them. At first, it was widely believed that they did this because they were ordered to, and for the record, if this were the case, that still would have been insanely brave of them. But as it turns out, this is far from true. The band members were in fact not ship employees, which means that they had the same rights as any passengers to leave. So why didn't they? Well, it is now widely believed that it most likely was so that they could use their music to help calm people so that they wouldn't panic. That's some major bravery right there. In our number nine spot today, we have a men's shoe. This artifact is one of the rarest to be shown of the items that have been recovered from the Titanic wreckage because of the fact that it is in such poor condition. All that remains of the shoe are the welt, top cap, and just a touch of the insole. This artifact does a couple things. It reminds you of the very real humans who became victims of 
this tragedy, and it also reminds you of the unrelenting nature of the ocean. Seeing the personal belongings of the passengers, regardless of knowing who specifically the shoe belonged to in their story, just adds a personal element, like you almost knew them. And then seeing how torn up the shoe has become is a strong reminder to us all that we truly are no match for Mother Nature, and the ocean is one of the most powerful and frightening things on the earth. In our number 8 spot today we have a love letter. Richard Geddes was a cabin attendant on the Titanic who wrote a love letter to his wife while aboard, but unfortunately she would never go on to receive it. The letter was written on the original Titanic stationery, and it even had its original white star line envelope when it was found. While this story in itself is of course extremely sad, and again one of those reminders of the human side of those who were in this incident, this letter also contained something else beside utterings and confessions of love. It also featured a description that Richard wrote for his wife of a near collision that the Titanic had with the SS City of New York, obviously prior to the terrible iceberg incident. There were people who had witnessed this near collision and believed that it was a bad omen for the Titanic. In our number 7 spot today we have a pocket watch. Okay, this artifact most certainly isn't the scariest one on today's list, but the story behind who it belonged to is one for the books. Sinai Cantor was 34 years old when he was a passenger on the Titanic. On board with him was his wife Miriam, and the pair were from Russia. They purchased second class passenger tickets, which at the time cost them 26 pounds, which is about $3,666 in today's money. When tragedy struck and the Titanic was sinking, Sinai immediately thought of his wife. He was able to get her aboard one of the life rafts thankfully, and as far as I know, she was rescued from the icy waters. Unfortunately, the same could not be said for him, however, as he ended up being one of those who passed away in the sinking of the ship. During rescue efforts, this pocket watch ended up being recovered from his body. In our number 6 spot today we have the inspection card. This inspection card once belonged to a woman named Marion Meanwell. What could possibly be worrisome about an inspection card? Well, it shows how Marion was not intended to be on the Titanic, but by some turn of events she unfortunately found herself as one of the passengers. The card shows that she was originally meant to be travelling on a ship called the Majestic. For some reason, the trip she originally had planned was delayed and she instead was assigned to the ill-fated Titanic. You can see that the word Majestic was crossed out on her card which shows us the change in plans. If only people were able to see what was about to strike and could have warned her. In our number 5 spot today we have the Titanic radio. Okay. Don't yell at me. This is a piece of the ship that has not yet been recovered, but it's the focus of much debate on whether or not it should be retrieved from the wreckage. Known in 1912 as the Marconi Wireless Telegraph Machine, the radio on the Titanic sent distress calls to nearby ships that ended up saving the lives of 700 people in lifeboats. Despite how many people died in the Titanic tragedy, many of their bodies have never been recovered, which is why there were debates about whether or not to retrieve the artifact because of the fact that there might still be remains located in the same area as the radio is. Lawyers have argued against the recovery of the radio because the dive plan did not include the prospect of there being human remains located down there. It also was argued because in order to retrieve it, they would need to cut into the ship's radio compartment, which was strongly opposed by preservation advocates. As of right now, it appears as though the dive to retrieve the radio will still occur, but it isn't exactly clear when. This radio would be a very valuable artifact, but it also would hold an eerie tale of exactly when and how the radio was used during the final moments of the Titanic. In our number 4 spot today we have the telegraph. Separate from the radio we just talked about, the ship's telegraph machine was recovered in 1987 and this was used to relay commands to the engine room. So it was used as a communication device on board rather than to communicate with other ships. This telegraph machine is likely the one that was used to communicate to turn away from the iceberg in the North Atlantic Ocean. Unfortunately these commands came way too late as the ship struck the iceberg only 37 seconds after it was finally seen, and we all know what happened next. This telegraph was actually part of a Titanic auction that featured over 5,000 recovered artifacts that were selling for a combined some $200 million. In our number 3 spot today we have the bell. The bell from the crow's nest of the Titanic was recovered from the wreckage and returned to land where it now resides in the Titanic Museum. The eerie story behind this bell is that it would have been the one that was rung three times by the lookout. Frederick Fleet in order to attempt to warn of the iceberg that was ahead. Frederick, as well as the other lookout who 
was with him, Reginald Lee, both ended up thankfully surviving the incident and went on to later explain what happened from their point of view. They explained that if they had been given binoculars to assist with their job, they could have seen the iceberg sooner. When asked how much sooner, Frederick replied, well, enough to get out of the way. In our number 2 spot today we have the big piece. This was a 15 ton section of the Titanic that ended up being recovered from the ocean floor. The wreckage of the Titanic was not found until 1985 when oceanographer Robert Ballard was doing a secret underwater expedition. The big piece is about 26 by 12 feet and it was once a section of the ship's starboard side hull. This piece also has a part of the original support beam that attached this piece to the frame of the ship. It is said that where this piece was located on the ship, basically everything else around it was absolutely obliterated when the ship split in two. This artifact is said to be the reminder of the most violent aspect of the sinking of the ship, which is a horrifying thought. It was found among many other smaller pieces of the ship that had all been broken up. In our number one spot today we have this cherub statue. In the remnants of the Titanic, they recovered a broken cherub statue that once found its home on the grand staircase of the Titanic. Aside from cherubs just being kind of creepy in general, there's something exceptionally eerie about this piece of religious iconography being at the center of such a huge disaster, as well as being found among the wreckage years later. Cherubs are usually known as bearers of the throne or creatures who attend to God, so it's just a little creepy to have one at the scene of a terrible disaster, as well as it making through all of the years and years that the Titanic was underwater waiting to be found. Thank you.